Hitler didn't have any money. You can only build autobahns with one thing, capital investment, and that investment came mainly from America. The Nazis were also given a lot of help from the city of London, help which came mainly in the shape of Sir Montague Collett Norman, Governor of the Bank of England. Norman was connected to Bush and Walker through the merger of Harriman's with the Brown Brothers, who traded in London as Brown Shipley, hence Brown Brothers Harriman. The people behind this multinational investment bank had a long-standing racial tradition. Few British people at the time were aware that they only enjoyed relatively cheap clothing because it was all made from slave cotton brought from America on the Brown Brothers ships and sold to British mill owners. Montague Norman was heir to this colossal Brown Brothers fortune. As the de facto head of world banking, he made no secret of his only being interested in the richest 1% of people. And even as the newspapers began to fill with stories of Nazi concentration camps, he still declared himself to be Hitler's most avid supporter. We must lend Nazi Germany 90 million marks, he declared. It may never be repaid, but it will be less of a loss than the fall of Nazism. One might have thought Sir Montague's close personal friends, the royal family, would have been outraged by his comments. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is part of the remit of this film to try and make people aware of the tricks the rich play in order to control how we think. George Orwell once said that the ruling class in every age have tried to impose a false view of the world upon their followers. And there's no better example than the way in which the British have been duped into believing that their royal family are called Windsor and descend from English kings like Henry VIII. The British royal family are, actually, German, and their real name is Saxe Coburg Gotha. They only changed it to Windsor after Windsor Castle in 1917 to hide the fact that they were German during the First World War. Prince Harry, in honour of his German roots, has been known to dress as a Nazi on several occasions. Dozens of critics have pointed out that the Duke of Edinburgh's brother was the head of the Nazi SS. And King Edward VIII, before he abdicated to marry the American divorcee Wallace Simpson, visited Hitler to make it abundantly clear to the whole world that he too was a Nazi. He even signed his name Herzog von Windsor. I hope it will be plain to people by now that Hitler's economic miracle is the greatest myth in human history. There was no economic miracle. There are no miracles. And if there are, why can't the Germans do it all again now? If you want to construct a network of new roads and new steelworks and new factories, you need one thing, money. You need investment. And the investment didn't come from Hitler. It came from Brown Brothers Harriman and their business associate, Fritz Thiessen. It came from Jalmar Schacht and his best friend, Sir Montague Collett Norman. It came from men like Axel Wenegren, the Swedish multimillionaire arms manufacturer, and Charles Bedeau, the French business mogul. These people were all in the same bed with their Nazi friends, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, the Dulles brothers, Prescott Sheldon Bush, and George Herbert Walker, with whom they'd created the Union Bank for laundering Nazi money. With the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt finally realized he had to do something. His response was the Trading with the Enemy Act, which allowed him to seize assets like the Union Bank, through which Bush, Walker and Harriman had been financing Thiessen. Roosevelt didn't realize, however, that it was already a case of too little, too late. Because without his knowledge, American business moguls had been tumbling over one another for two years in their efforts to assist and do business with the Hitler regime. Typical of this American spirit of enterprise was Sosthenes Ben, the president of AT&T, who flew immediately to Berlin when war was declared to put in Hitler's phone lines. He gave the Nazis the most high-tech, state-of-the-art telecommunication system in the world at that time so that Hitler could rule the European mainland with the maximum efficiency. Rich men have been hiring thugs to do their dirty work, especially to frighten people, since human civilization began. 
What people have to try to appreciate is that Nazism, in reality, was simply the first time in human history that the rich had enough wealth to hire an entire country of thugs to do their dirty work. Some of the most emotive images in world history are those of the Nazi war machine sweeping across the Low Countries to begin their occupation of France. And people have always assumed that the trucks used for the miles-long troop convoys must have been German trucks. But if anyone at that time had taken the trouble to lift up the cowling and look at the engine, they would have found these were actually Ford trucks, which had been built with personal permission from Henry Ford, who was sitting in his office 4,000 miles away in Dearborn, Michigan, a service for which he was given the Grand Cross of the Eagle, the highest honour the Nazis ever bestowed on a civilian. Ford sued the U.S. Army, uh, the U.S. Uh, government in, uh, in the 50s because during the war the U.S. Uh, Air Force bombed their tank making faci facilities in Germany. And they, this is true. And what was it, like 52 or something? They sued the U.S. government for, for destroying their factories. And they won. They won the lawsuit. So I had to write a little song for Henry here. Ford built tanks for the Nazis, and the Nazis used those tanks to gun down lots of soldiers in the U.S. Army ranks. Yes, Henry Ford was a fascist and a nasty one, was he? He built tanks for anyone and for the proper fee. Henry Ford... Hitler so admired Henry Ford, he kept a life-size portrait of him on the wall next to his desk, and even his legendary Panzer tanks were tainted by these sorts of practices, because they were made by I.G. Farben who had entered into a cartel with the Rockefellers' Standard Oil. The government in Washington knew all about this, and largely did nothing. Licensing arrangements for trading with the enemy in wartime were issued without any fuss, even to the extent that after the occupation of France, the Chase and Morgan banks in Paris simply carried on doing business as usual. The incredible truth, which the rich elite have managed to hide from the world for 70 years through their control over school books and our education system, is that the Nazi war machine was actually an American business. And for the Rockefellers, DuPonts, Harrimans, Walkers and Bushes in particular, it was a highly lucrative business. If they had wanted to, the Western multinationals could have grounded the Luftwaffe and stopped the war at any time because the German aircraft were totally dependent on imported supplies of tetraethyl lead, an additive which prevents knocking in aero engines. But Standard Oil kept the supply of this vital resource going through neutral Switzerland for the entire war. And any Dutch people who might be wondering at this point what kind of percentage the Swiss took from this little arrangement, they need to be aware that thanks to Prince Bernhard von Lippe of the Netherlands, the father of the recently retired Queen Beatrix, and prominent member of the Nazi party, Royal Dutch Shell gave Hitler millions of tonnes of crude oil for nothing. The Dutch royal family actually fuelled the invasion force which annexed Holland and were instrumental in helping the Nazis to rape their own country. But most shocking of all is the truth of what really happened in the little Polish town of Otswitzim. This sleepy little hamlet just happened to be in an extremely mineral-rich region, particularly for coal, which Western industrialists had wanted to get their hands on for years. With the coming of the Hitler regime and the invasion of Poland, the fascist financiers had the bright idea of turning this conquered region into an investor's paradise by building a Nazi concentration camp near the town and utilising the slave labour available to drastically reduce their own production costs. Few people are aware of the gigantic scale of the Nazi concentration camp network and are blissfully unaware that the real purpose behind their construction was to make a profit for the rich. Which is why they stole all the gold watches, gold wedding rings and gold teeth fillings and melted them down into gold ingots. To this day, there are bars of gold lying in the vaults of the Bank of England which have the Nazi swastika stamped on them. Gold stolen from Jewish corpses. 
It shouldn't come as any great surprise that George Herbert Walker's family were slave owners on the cotton plantations of 1930s America. Walker was used to organising slave labour. So while his business associate, Averill Harriman, was paying for Hitler's half-million SS troops and supplying them all with brand new Thompson submachine guns, because he did, Walker took over the management of this new Polish concentration camp. And when his Nazi friends started complaining that they couldn't pronounce the name Oswitzium any better than I can, they all got together and decided they had better Germanize the name into something which sat more comfortably on Nazi tongues. It was in this way that the world first heard of Auschwitz. Because the truth about Auschwitz and the entire Nazi war machine is that they were essentially no different to McDonald's. They were American business enterprises abroad, businesses which the richest European families invested in and businesses which because of slave labor, made obscene profits, which Prescott Sheldon Bush took and placed in a blind trust, which later financed a Bush political dynasty, which produced two presidents of the United States, his son, George Herbert Walker Bush, and his grandson, George Walker Bush. This picture of the railway leading into Auschwitz has, since World War II, become the iconic image of the Holocaust. To us, it now represents something like the gate to hell, but how differently, one wonders, would we have looked at this image all of our lives if we had always known that this railway line was an American railway line laid by the Harriman brothers on behalf of Uncle Sam. The Standard Oil IG Farben cartel even made the Zyklon B gas for the Jewish Holocaust. Now anyone who at this point is thinking that all this simply cannot be true because if it was, someone would have sued, well someone did. This information came into the public domain because of a Dutch intelligence agent who was so disgusted when he found all of this out, he leaked it to the press. As a result of which, two very senior Jewish gentlemen, Kurt Julius Goldstein and Peter Gingold, filed suit against the American government. Of course, the more discriminating among us will now be asking how it can be that this story went completely unreported in the mainstream media. One might just as well ask why the Times in London was writing favourable stories about the Nazi concentration camps throughout the 1930s, and why Lord Rothmere was still referring to Hitler as a great gentleman as late as 1940. You really would think by now that people would have realised that it isn't so much the bias in the media which really matters, it's the things they know about, but never tell you, that really matter. Because the truth is that the press knew exactly what was going on in the concentration camps all through the war. They never said a word about it, because they knew who was making money from the slave labour. Now, it's very easy to imagine what the response of a conservative politician, American or British, would be to all of this. If all of this is true, he's bound to ask why nobody said a word about American industrialists building Hitler's war machine at the Nuremberg trials. How come it never got mentioned? Where's the responsibility of the Vatican, who signed in 1933 the Concordat with Hitler, giving him his first tremendous prestige? Are we now to find the Vatican guilty? Where's the responsibility of the world leader Winston Churchill, who said in an open letter to the London Times in 1938, 1938, Your Honor, were England to suffer national disaster, I should pray to God to send a man of the strength of mind and will of an Adolf Hitler. Are we now to find Winston Churchill guilty? Where's the responsibility of those American industrialists who helped Hitler to rebuild his armaments and profited by that rebuilding. Are we now to find the American industrialists guilty? No, Your Honor, no. Germany alone is not guilty. The whole world is as responsible for Hitler as Germany. It is an easy thing to condemn one man in the dark. It is easy to condemn the German people to speak of the basic flaw in the German character that allowed Hitler to rise to power. But at the same time, comfortably, ignore 
the basic flaw of character that made the Russian sign pacts with him, Winston Churchill praise him, American desolates profit by him, American desolates profit by him, 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 profit by him.